so some time ago i purchased this swatch um dot card uh, i believe it was jerry artorama uh, and uh, i kept postponing to swatch it but now i notice that some of the dots the one that had more significant paint like this little guy here this starts to flakes off and fall out so i decided to finally give it a go and try to swatch these colors and see if i want to extend my uh, winter and newton collection i like all of the colors i bought from them they have very interesting properties i also found some of the made in england i think that was the previous uh, location with where these paints were manufactured so i have some of those tubes but most of them are from their new uh, made in france which i'm um, i don't know much about the paints before that and compared to the colors uh, that were made in england i didn't see much of a difference and of course some of the pigments um like this cobalt violet right here um i know that's a hard to rewet paint and uh, I'm not sure if the original formula was easier to rewet or if it still had the same properties. If some of you out there ever painted with uh, Windsor Newton Cobalt Violet uh, when they were still made in England, let me know if you notice any difference. Let everybody know who's curious about these kind of things. I added the black marker line uh, because for, I noticed from my previous paint experiments that and from my just from painting that transparency it's important for me i tend to um like my paintings where i use mostly transparent colors i notice with the um, opaque colors um, i tend to get overworked paintings easier and lose a little bit of the luminosity and uh, studio cat is here and open my door so let me go close it and then we're gonna start swatching all right so first color uh this lemon yellow and i wrote down uh, the pigment information you could always find them on the website um i didn't pre-wet these colors i know some of them they'll be easier to re-wet than others and then my cat is gonna make my camera uh move from time to time but no worries no earthquakes in my area as of right now yes no much paint provided but that's okay um i don't know what if people use uh, let me zoom you even more in so we can appreciate the swatches hopefully the glare is not gonna be too terrible there we go so that was lemon yellow uh, opaque um, nickel titanate uh, that's the um, also the pigment name this bismuth yellow the dot is very small also um semi-transparent very bright very nice yellow the next one it's a, a cadmium lemon also um opaque and cadmium colors usually they are but the um the vibrancy of the yellows they're probably one of the best and the Windsor and Newton came up with a cadmium free line of colors. I haven't tried them. I'm not sure what kind of pigment they use. Uh, it says it life fast one. And I do have a lot of yellows from my Sennelier collection. Although um, Sophie Yellow, the one I tested and I really liked, turned out to be somewhat... Um, not so life fast as they advertise uh, winter lemon i believe i have this color and they have this a uh, square with just a line to it i know that's semi-transparent the square with the a darker triangle on the top that's semi-opaque to me it's a matter of how much deposit it's on the dark line once um the paint 
had dried off. And with this uh, yellow here, honestly, I don't see much of a difference in hue. Maybe the bismuth yellow, slightly um, opaque, desaturated the uh, this lemon yellow. Most almost like a. I don't even know how to describe it. Like a Naples yellow, but more lemon. Yeah, definitely opaque. Windsor lemon, and I notice with the naming of colors um, with um, even Sennelier has the Sennelier yellow and Sennelier red same with wind uh, with the winter in Newton and I was uh, debating of um, putting together palettes with these colors um, and then see how they perform if the manufacturer intended to be almost like a basic set like the colors you absolutely needed uh, lemon yellow deep another yellow color this is also slightly harder to re-wet i'm not sure about the pigment of this one if it's uh, some sort of a cadmium it looks like aurelian this probably is the original aurelian the I think it's PY40. Very beautiful well, yellow, but it grays out yeah, in Maston when exposed to light and diluted. Um, it disappears, unfortunately. But yeah, um, let me see. I have a list here of the Windsor and Newton pigments. It's on a separate uh, paper. I wrote them down. So Aurelian, yes, is the original PY uh, 40, transparent, very beautiful, but mostly I would use it for um, sketch work. Trying to make sure my table is dry because on the back side of this paper, uh, this is another set of colors. And most of you um, have seen this on YouTube, so you know how this um this swatch parties go. I hope my my phone is able to focus the light. It's not the best. The sun is setting, and probably I should have cleaned the lens before I started. Uh, transparent yellow looks to me like a PY one hundred and fifty, and this is one thing I observed. The transparent colors usually in this concentrated form look very dark and nothing almost nothing like the color they turn out when they're wet but this is a very beautiful bright uh, pigment PY 150 um, if you want luminous color luminous paintings they will, they will always perform uh, another cadmium yellow pale opaque color but very nice and I like more of the warm yellows uh, with the lemon yellows I always find them a little bit too sharp and um, I hardly ever use it there's more yellows on the back of this paper but actually let me try and open up this pamphlet let me pause for a second and I'm back I decided to turn the page and continue I want to see all the yellows be able to compare this is another cadmium free color um also opaque uh, light fast one uh, probably a replacement from cadmium yellow pale i cannot try and get them together in the same frame yep very similar for people who don't want to use uh, heavy metals in their paintings or more environmentally conscious. Uh, next one, uh, Turner Yellow. I believe this is a. Oh, it actually, it's not a blend of pigment. It says here's PY216. Um, it's not a pigment you see very often in watercolors. I don't remember seeing him in any collection. Maybe Rutai yellow from, from 
schminke but overall a very nice yellow if i ever in need of a opaque yellow I, I really like this slightly orange but only so slightly i can still call it yellow new gumbos so again remember the uh, darker dot usually indicates a transparent color and this is a mixture of pigments uh, py 209 and py 150 very similar to the transparent yellow we saw earlier i would say almost identical if you have one you probably don't need the other one in this case i would go with the single pigment um, transparent yellow and now in my favorite yellows the one that tend more to orange uh one of them the windsor yellow deep it's semi-opaque semi-transparent and the indian yellow it's transparent so i'm curious how they compare because that would probably be my choice but cadmium yellow classic cadmium all right so cadmium yellow and cadmium free yellow very similar in this case i actually prefer the cadmium free one at least at this point uh, we'll wait to see how they dry up it looks slightly more transparent uh, Windsor yellow deep again this is a warm yellow so probably if you want to do a split primary uh, palette the Windsor yellow and this Windsor yellow deep will cover your uh, needs for a warm and cool yellow Indian yellow this is also a mix of pigments pigment orange 62 and py 139 Um, yep, it is transparent. I actually like it a little better than this Windsor Yellow Deep. I feel like the yellow in this Indian Yellow, it's a little bit more bright and intense. Yeah, that would be a hard choice between these two. I think they're both very pretty. I'll probably go with the Indian Yellow just for the transparency. Uh, the next one... Uh, Cadmium yellow deep, another opaque yellow, very warm, leaning towards orange, but still a yellow undertone. And then the cadmium free yellow. Similar properties, similar hue. Uh, it'll be interesting to um, do some color mixes see how they react with the other colors and a cadmium orange uh, opaque very nice very easy to rewet i was kind of impressed with that um, but these are all the yellows we let them dry and i'll go back to the next row it starts with a cadmium free orange And next we have the cadmium free orange and i wish you'll be closer to the previous orange this probably wants to be the cadmium free version it looks very nice also opaque windsor orange uh, semi-opaque a beautiful color um a lot of people mix their own oranges it's so easy to do but i believe the brightness it's very hard to achieve sometimes just by mixing two colors you have to get a very warm yellow and a very warm uh, transparent red um, and then there's some benefits if you want um, have a painting where you use a lot of the color to get more like a a flat wash or an even wash this transparent orange, this is very, very nice. I can see it is transparent. It slightly rings redder to me and almost like a fall orange. It's not as bright or doesn't have that um, true orange color to me, but it's a very pretty um, red orange. And my cat decided to play with a pen he found. So sorry about the camera shake. 
uh, another orange another winter orange this one is the red shade and almost like a french vermilion it reminds me of a sennelia color um, actually there are two of them that are very similar they should come up in my paint experiment soon they look very transparent but then on the um, dark line you can see some particles interesting very nice hue i can see uh, being used in florals let me just um, give some treats to the studio cat and i'll be right back And let's continue swatching the Winter and Newton Professional Watercolor Dot chart. Um, next color here is the Cadmium Scarlet. It's um, another cadmium color. Uh, most cadmiums are opaque. And it's um, a very beautiful warm red. Or um, I would say maybe a red orange. It's very hard to decide uh, with this color how to call them. I know a lot of people think of orange, probably something in this range, and this will go into the warm reds. Uh, but regardless, um, to me, the most important thing about a red is how does it mix with the, with blues, what kind of purples I can get. I think that's the ultimate test. This is the Cadmium Free Scarlet, very close in hue easy to re-wet also it has a very nice undertone and i should have left the spot a little bit lighter yeah pretty nice very close so if you want to switch from uh, cadmium colors to non-cadmium this would be a good alternative same thing, uh, light fast one. The only thing with this one is it doesn't have the staining property, which you are if you're a beginner, a beginner that's probably um, a benefit because with watercolor it's very hard to fix mistakes. You have to be very intentional. Where do you apply colors? And then because we cannot control the movement of color in water, well, up to a certain extent we can, but uh, when we're new and we're just starting to learn about colors and how they react then it's it's very likely that we have a color where we don't want it or uh, going over an edge we would like not to this one is a scarlet lake semi-transparent staining um, light fast to a lot of the red colors unfortunately are not very light fast but it's a very pretty color um, this is a cadmium red definitely slightly cooler than the previous cadmium scarlet but nonetheless a very nice color although i like red as a color i have a hard time using it uh, because I like mostly the very concentrated bright colors and to obtain that in watercolor sometimes you have to use concentrated paint or you have to layer the paint so again you have to be very intentional with the concentration of paint in your wash and also if you plan to layer you have to have a good paper a lot of techniques just in order to uh, create the painting you want or you have in your mind cadmium red deep another opaque red also on a warm side i would say more orange uh, but we have to let this dry and then we can get a better idea of 
how they actually look. And next to this uh, cadmium red deep, it's a cadmium free red deep. And I'm checking to see on my list, uh, but there's no pigment information about this color. Uh, the cadmium red deep across the page is a PR 108 and a lot of the cadmium reds is that particular pigment. Uh, some more um, desaturated reds and also it's probably among the only reds that have um, some granulation, some texture. I'm not sure. Schminke's uh, Volcano Red or one of their colors they use in the Volcano set. Uh, what kind of pigment that is. But I'll um, check and probably bring it up later on when we talk more about reds and granulation. And I'm trying to move this without creating too much of a ruckus. <laughs> uh, Windsor Red. And you can see I circled the colors that have the Windsor uh, name in uh, part of, as part of their names. I want to see um, if my theory is right. If the company uh, uses this uh, strategy of naming to kind of point you um to the ideal or maybe like a starter set of colors that you could start painting and not feel like you're missing any colors um, rose dore uh, i know senelia has a rose dore or rose door but it's it's very different than this one this one is hard to rewet and pigment it's actually a mix of pigment py19 pv19 and py97 so yeah i'm not sure what's the purpose of this maybe portraits very light red and there's not much on the dot you can see i almost scrape it all off soft kind of pinkish orange coral if you want to uh, quinacridone red. Usually quinacridone reds are PR uh, 209. I know Daniel Smith calls it um, Queen Coral. It's a very interesting pigment. Uh, it come, it's coming up next in my series of paint experiments. It's very hard to place because it looks like a a cool red but then when you put it next to a cool red it has an orange undertone it's not quite pink uh, this one doesn't get too intense but i'll let it sit there for a while and we'll see what happens uh, Windsor red deep um, very raspberry reminds me of quinacridone fuchsia from daniel smith uh, PR264. I'm not sure if uh, I've seen this pigment before, but definitely when it comes to the hue, very much like Daniel Smith Fuchsia. We'll see how it dries. Next, it's a collection of alizarins, some permanent, or at least uh, named, as, named as such. But certain mixes, I know. Um, Da Vinci uses a permanent alizarin crimson that's a PV19. This one, it's a collection mix of pigments two, 206 maybe and 179. Just a dark, cool red. Um, it's classified as transparent. It's a very pretty color. And next to it is the alizarin crimson, and I believe this is the original pigment, PR83. Let's see how close it's in hue. And yes, the um, Windsor & Newton does a good job matching uh, original, maybe fugitive or discontinued pigments. Uh, I know they have a queen gold 
Uh, I can't wait to see how that compares to Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith was my first green gold I used and it was not the original PO49. But still to me that's the first um, queen gold. Permanent Carmine. We get into more pinkish reds. Uh, not a staining, transparent colors. I like this um, in landscapes to mix to get like bright violets, but mostly I I would see it using uh, florals or anywhere you need a bright pink. Permanent rose and rose matter genuine. Another collection of pink reds. Oh, this one is really really nice very very nice hue but life fast it's only two and probably um, even less permanent rose oh, actually it's a pv19 i'm surprised a pv19 only two light fast so far um, my favorite uh, rose is the da vinci red rose deep for some reason i I like that the most, uh, although the difference between Da Vinci and Daniel Smith quinacridone rose are very small. There's something about that tiny little color desaturation that um, I prefer. Probably because every so slightly it leans to our warm red, which is my favorite kind of red. And rose matter genuine, similar to the permanent rose. Maybe more natural, uh, desaturated almost, but yeah, it's a very, very nice pink color. And all the sets have to have an opera rose, a fugitive color, very bright neon. Um, I believe if you use a lot of sketchbooks. Or if you scan your art, or oh, I don't know how this particular color scans. Mm, yeah, if you like neon colors, definitely fl for florals. It just gives that glow to your petals that make them look very natural. And I have a giant glare. Here we go. Not much better. Um, Quinacridone magenta. Here is where things get interesting. I know certain brands use magenta for more of a pink color. Other use, uh, to me, this is almost like a violet. Um, but regardless of the naming of the color, just go with the shades you like, um, mix them and see what kind of uh, results you get. A lot of times with watercolor, um, it's not just like with um, primary colors or colors that contain white. You get unusual results based on the color property. Uh, and this is a permanent magenta, which to me it's almost um, a violet color, like a queen violet. And I believe also a PV, uh, PV19. Yes, permanent magenta PV19. I have this color from Schminke, and I mentioned it before. It has a, almost a metallic property to it. It's very hard to describe, but if you see it, you almost uh, it looks like a stainless steel that you paint on top of it. It has a silver glow. And as it dries, you probably are able to see it, but especially in the lighter variation, definitely a gray, gray undertone. And this is the cobalt violet. Um, I got introduced to this color by Irit here on YouTube. She has a very, very inspiring, inspirational, whatever you want to call it, her YouTube channel, her art 
very playful full and bright hard to read wet uh, from this dot card i do have a tube of it and uh, if i leave the water on it before i start painting it does a pretty decent job of rewetting a permanent move um, this is a pv15 it also should be a granulating color hard to uh, rewet um, i brought a tube of this because i like the granulation and i thought it would um, give interesting mixes and it did uh, some of my older videos i explored this and probably i should explore a little bit more with these granulating colors and painting with them also and i have a cat hair of course uh, a little easier to rewet than the cobalt violet but not as bright and um, as clean of a color and as this dot is is really really small so on this swatch it's only gonna get as dark as it can moving on another quinacridone color this is a queen violet very intense this and permanent magenta are probably my favorite uh, violet colors they have that um, metallic property silver almost background i would like to put together a palette just with quinacridones or very nice uh, intense color um, also this have are also very transparent and life fest one which with such a bright colors i wonder if the brightness will stay the same ultramarine violet i think this is a pv15 probably similar with the permanent mauve and the cobalt violet uh, low staining granulating very light colors you can see how um, using a low staining versus a high tinting uh, string palette would create very very different artwork depending what kind of look would you like or you prefer or how do you use your colors then you can have um, a kind of a uniform palette that would make it very easy to create the look you want in your paintings another color that i um, draw a square around it this is the um, dioxys in violet or winds of violet um, transparent color um, also uh, staining intense series one which means it's not a very expensive color and i looked over all the colors that have the windsor in their name and they're all series one so if you want to try with sarah newton start with this collection i would say of uh, pigments all the colors that have the windsor um, in their name and then see if you like them give them a try this is the indentrine blue my favorite one is the m gram it's very grayed out desaturated very intense it can get very dark i did have some interesting effects with the m gram one um, probably because of the quality of water i have to use it with uh, purify water or i'm not sure i'm still looking into that um, very nice blue this indentrine i wouldn't call it an indentrine but let's see how it dries out it does have a drying shift it kind of loses its brightness uh, so i'm expecting this to happen with uh, windsor and newton although even applying it in this form it's much brighter and bluer than other indentrine um, or indentrone blues that i used cobalt blue deep um, i have this in the set from theo and i like the shade and i like the granulation it has a, a very obvious um, separation of pigment in water you'll see as it dries and the more water you use it almost creates a 
system of veins and clumps of pigment. I'm not sure how much you can tell from this dot and on this paper, but um, these are the blue, go the violets going into the blues. And we'll see more. Um, my favorite Windsor and Newton color, uh, it's coming up uh, on the next page. French Ultramarine, a uh, classic blue color. I know many artists use it. Some of them, they don't like it at all, either because of the hue or because of the texture. You can try Schminkes, uh, I believe Ultramarine Finest. I do not have a tube of it, but I'm very curious to see if, um, if it's really a non-granulating Ultramarine. I do not mind the shade. I like its uh, vibrancy um, and it creates a very interesting um, mix, very interesting mixes in my landscapes. It gives them a little bit of a freshness and um, compared with the cobalt blue, cobalt blue has that powdery look and yeah that's in this swatch it is a little bit more dry but regardless um, if you want a more natural look uh, and you don't mind um, paying a little extra the cobalt blue it's a series four so it's a very expensive paint to start with but it does look natural probably in landscapes uh, if you use it straight from the tube without um, mixing it you would rather have that um, ultramarine it looks brighter and I can see how in an, somebody who looks for a natural uh, landscape, a more natural look, they might not like that. Or they would have to mix it with other colors to sort of um, cut some of that sharpness, that bright blue coming through that maybe is not as common in nature. And as the indentrium blue is drying, you can see it lost a little bit of its brightness. And I should have let it dry on the camera, uh, but we'll see when it's completely dry how it compares uh, with other colors, with other indenturing, or uh, that's a PB60 if you keep track of the pigments and not so much of the name of the colors, which I find it much easier to look at the pigment number. Sometimes the color name can be deceiving, especially for me in the uh, violet and purple or in the, or the cooler reds. I feel like people use things, um, whatever it's appealing to them. And right here, uh, Smalt or Diamond Blue, it's probably one of my most used colors from Windsor & Newton. I had it in my palette um, when I went on a trip to California and I enjoyed using it for shadows, even for the color of the sky. Uh, it has a slight violet hue, but it dries off more bluer than it looks right now. Very, very nice color. Uh, series 3, so a little bit pricier, but I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, ultramarine. And I, I never knew, know what the difference between French ultramarine and ultramarine or ultramarine light or deep. Uh, I'll have a, in my paint experiment, I'll compare side by side all the ultramarines I have. And I hope by the time I get to that stage, uh, I will hopefully be able to purchase an ultramarine finest from Schmincke. I know that's another color I don't need but I would love to have just for that and we see how um, these differences in the name would um, you know how, how do people who name the colors what do they think when they say French or not French or deep or whatever name they choose to. And also this ultramarine, I see there in parentheses, is called a green shade. So probably compared with a French ultramarine, I can tell it's slightly greener. But not enough. I, I want to know compared to 
another brand that called their ultramarine if there's much difference uh, cobalt blue is next and this is probably the perfect blue uh, another series four and i can see why people would like this color mm -hmm. I'm not sure if oh yeah we have cerulean blue in the collection from wizard they, they're gonna come later on um i do not care much for the cerulean i know maybe cerulean they meant to paint the sky with to me they're just too green to use in a sky although um winsor newton has a red shade and a cerulean so we'll see but this is a very beautiful blue I can see why people would love this cobalt blue and I probably will get very very nice bright greens and uh, very interesting purples in the mix and it probably has uh, some texture being a cobalt and for that one I know that cobalt deep it's a PB74 I want to say let me look at my book here Yes, Cobalt Blue Deep, it's a PB74, and Cobalt Blue, it's a PB28. Um, I have two PB28s, I want to say, in the Sennelier uh, collection. When we get to that part in the blue color experiment, paint experiment, we get to see them side by side. But I would definitely like this color from Windsor and Newton. And then the phthalo colors, uh, very, very transparent and staining. This is a Windsor blue red shade, probably a PB15 uh, colon 6. Very, very intense. I can see it um, using it in sketches in more um, kind of cartoon. Uh, drawing or even in regular paintings mixed with um, earth tones it would probably lead to some interesting shades of gray or uh, blue grays especially yeah um, the red shade is just says pb15 and even the windsor blue green shade pb15 i don't know if um, windsor and newton distinguish between different columns or if that information is present somewhere and let's move on to the last three blues uh, on this part of the swatch card we have the Antwerp blue and that's a pb27 and prussian blue these are the same pigments uh, series one transparent light fast one one is described as staining and uh, this Anwar Blue is non-staining, which I'm not sure if it's the same pigment why one would be staining and other would not. But here they are. No, not my, much difference that I can see. This uh, Prussian Blue rewets a little bit easier and it gets dark very, very fast. And you've probably already seen videos uh, on YouTube with uh, Prussian Blue having that interesting property of fading in the sunlight and then regaining its brightness while it's placed in the shade. I haven't tried that, but I'm curious just for the sake of the experiment to see if uh, that's a true thing or if it's possible. With a blue green shade. This is what I expect for a classic phalo blue uh, 15 uh, column 3. Very, very intense, very tropical green. And see them side by side with a red shade. I can see a little bit of a difference. It's hard to see the Windsor blue red shade near the cobalt blue. That's a very, very um, classic blue, I would say the most pure blue you can get uh, you can see how much the winter blue leans to green in that particular swatch 
but then compared to the uh, Windsor blue green shade they're definitely a difference um, in how much red you can detect or how much one is cooler and warmer and if you have a hard time with uh, cool and warm blues um, the cooler blues are the ones leaning towards green and the warmer blues the ones leaning towards red that's how I keep them uh, kind of straight in my mind this um, cerulean blue red shade it's a light color blue I can see how you could use it for sky compared to the cobalt blue slightly uh, cooler leaning towards green but I would still call it a blue comparing to the uh, Windsor blue green shade you can definitely see the difference much closer to a pure blue and not so much a green undertones but I'm expecting the cerulean blue right here to be greener and it is it leans towards um, one of those teal turquoise colors I'm not sure exactly how would I use this one of course um, they're both series 3 the cerulean blue is um, only semi opaque while the cerulean blue red shade it's opaque do you need both of them I don't think so I would choose the cerulean blue red shade just because I green is not my favorite color <laughs> and even anything leaning towards green I have a hard time um, enjoying them or looking at them speaking of green that would be on the next um, part of our swatch but first I think we have the manganese blue hue uh, let's switch this card on manganese uh, blue hue and I have the Da Vinci uh, manganese blue mix which has the original PB33 this one to me just looks like a phthalo blue that maybe has white in it. Um, the uh, list of pigment is just says PB15 on oh, the list I have. Yeah, I don't see any appeal to this color. Maybe compared to the cerulean, um, this one is a series three, so less expensive somewhere i wanted to say first it's in between the red shade and the cerulean blue just a plain one it's very hard to place color and the dot was really small <laughs> like you can see it's almost gone it does seem like it has white in it but yeah, a nice um, alternative maybe to um cerulean it looks a little brighter um, and um, if you have a windsor blue green shade and you water it down you probably would get something similar this one i don't know if we started to try to recreate the texture of the pb 1333 but we'll see how it dries it does remind me slightly of um, Horizon Blue by Holbein. It is a mix of colors. Um, I'll probably pull out the swatch and compare it just because I'm very curious. Uh, I got the Holbein Blue, uh, uh, Horizon Blue. Uh, I've seen it in a swatch. I didn't realize at that time about the importance of having white mixed in the paint uh, because even if you like the hue of the color and you paint directly from the tube without mixing it once you mix any color with another color that has white in it the results are very unpredictable grayed out or pastel or i don't know if you want to see a video uh, with me comparing um horizon blue mixed with other colors and then a similar color in hue that doesn't have white um, just let me know in the comments uh, phyllo turquoise and aqua green and this looks like a, a pb16 
oh this aqua green it's really nice i don't even like greens but it has a very interesting transparency it reminds me of um the um permanent magenta a little bit with that gray undertone as it dries that metallic I'll look to them I believe aqua green it's a mix of pigments it reminds me of Daniel Smith um, turquoise mm, the name escapes me at this time but Daniel Smith has a color that looks very similar like this and it's also a mix and phalo turquoise from this collection it's pb16 and this um aqua green i don't have it listed i think it was a newer color before i wrote down the pigment name and so it's not on my list uh, cobalt turquoise i would assume this is a classic uh, pg50 it's a pigment green but to me I could almost use it as a blue only when I put it side by side even with this um, manganese blue hue I can see how much greener it is I have maybe four of this uh, P P P PG50 from different brands they'll come up in a paint experiments um, the hue is similar amongst them, the properties, I believe the smoother one is the Senelia with the less granulation and the most granulating is Daniel Smith, as some of you might have guessed. Uh, cobalt turquoise, I expect to be another granulating, um, the saturated turquoise and has that powdery property of cobalt semi-opaque i used the senelia one in one of my paintings and i used it in a very light wash and i truly enjoyed it uh, it created some interesting texture and separation it wouldn't i wouldn't pass it as a natural green but if you want to pa paint maybe like pine or like a maybe more colorful exaggerated forest even tropical waters this cobalt turquoise can be the green for you cobalt green deep another one more desaturated uh, green Slightly leaning towards blue. Maybe you can use this in a landscapes mixed with a little bit um, of um, earth colors. And um, it's an opaque color. Um, let me check the pigment out for that. Um, PG26. And the previous one, the cobalt turquoise was another P, PG30, cobalt green and cobalt green light. Um, let me move it a little bit so we can compare the same pigment, probably process, process a little bit different. One more brighter than the other. This. Uh, Cobalt turquoise light, cobalt turquoise, and cobalt green deep. This is a whole different pigment. Uh, PG26, and I believe this is the one I use in my forest painting, which makes more sense. Or is equivalent from oh, Senelia. Sorry for moving the camera too much. And here in this section, we'll see, we see another... Um, collection of those um, Windsor uh, colors with Windsor in their name but before we get to them we have a cobalt green and I use a little bit too much water this is another PG50 oh, I kind of lost track 
um, in my list um, I believe I copied the list of the pigment name from the website and then they had a few colors that were swapped out a few additional colors so they don't quite align but you get the idea all these greens you pretty much pick whichever you like look at their properties and think about how you're going to use them in your painting this is probably the most dislike colors the phalo green uh, they call them windsor green this is the blue shade it's a pg7 very bright unnatural if you paint probably modern art or somebody who really loves this shade of green um, they might appreciate it um, i found it very useful to mix very dark uh, vibrant colors uh, mix it with a transparent red and you would get interesting rays um, and colors along those lines and here is viridian um, i would say the much weaker in tinting strength uh, twin brother of this um, pg7 the winter green again i would think this color would be good in portraits to create um, little uh, green undertones or to kind of cool down reds in more for a more natural skin looking color winter green another uh, pigment green i want to say this is 36 much yellower than the winter green uh, blue shade as the name imply definitely this one leaning towards more towards yellow very vibrant very intense color um, they're both staining uh, i haven't used this a lot i know they have it in the Sennelier range but since my um dislike of greens i do not make an effort um to play with this too much from my Sennelier range i can imagine using it to um experiment mixing dark, dark colors with uh, different kinds of reds and we're moving on to a more natural selection of greens we start with terra verde another very pale uh, green color i would say the equivalent of viridian for windsor green uh, blue shade this would be similar to the windsor green yellow shade although maybe not as much yellow it's a grayed out grayed out green also in portraits i can see how that would be useful although i don't pick portraits or especially not realistic portraits at this time perling green I use this a lot for shadows and I use it to mix dark very dark colors I use the one from Da Vinci because it's readily available already poured in the pan um, Sennelli has the forest green that's a, a mix of colors um, I believe this is the original PBK 31 uh, one pigment yes very grayed out cool green i've seen a lot on youtube swatches of daniel smith perling green i'll probably have to look uh, see if i can compare them and um, yeah, experiment uh, oxide of chromium green oh, an opaque green I have this from Sennelia, another color I hardly ever use. Although I like I like its texture and in a watered down version it doesn't look that opaque and the hue surprisingly um I do not dislike. <laughs> it can be almost like a moss uh, moss green I can see how it would look nice in a landscape 
Sorry about the camera shake. I'm running out of room. Um, hooker's green. It's a blend of um, green colors or yellow colors. Different brands have um, different combination. I'm not sure who Hooker was or what his original uh, green looks like. So to me, it doesn't have much of a relevance or I don't have hardly any expectation. It's just another green that I probably won't, um, won't be interested in. Same thing with sap green. This is a permanent sap green. Um, looks very nice. Uh, yellow, yellowed green. Um, I know the Nisses green is the one that I use the most because it's readily available. It's uh, dark, very close to a natural green that I can just pick up from the palette and use. Now, olive green, it's a different story. Uh, I have this in a tube uh, from Windsor & Newton. And although I haven't used it yet, I could see myself using this in a kind of forest landscape, grasses, uh, even in fall landscape. The only downsides, um, I do love green gold. And if I have green gold on my palette, it's very easy to add any other green or a little bit of blue and come up with something similar to olive green and then if it's still too bright um, an earth tone added to the mix will make it look just right. And Turvert yellow shade this it's almost like a olive green but in a very desaturated, um, not desaturated, very pale wash, hard to re-wet. So between the Viridian, the Terravert and Terravert yellow shade, you have a very uh, nice transition from a blue green to a more middle of the pack green to a yellow mossy green. Yeah, it's very hard to re-wet. Probably if you want to paint very light paintings, very soft colors. And again, it probably has a place in portraits. <laughs> the last three colors from this section is the green gold. One of my favorite greens or um, cool yellows. <laughs> you can go either way. In a very light wash, it's almost as a lemon yellow, and especially this one from uh, Windsor and Newton. I could use it in drawings of lemons for sure. And then in the more concentrated form, um, it looks like a very nice olive especially if you add a little bit more green to it. Then we start the earth tones or the saturated collection of colors with this Naples yellow. I like the one from Daniel Smith. It's um, it's less yellow than um, I believe Sennelia was the other one I had for the longest time to compare it with. This one is very nice. I would say it's closer to the to the Sennelia ones with more yellow than uh, Daniel Smith. That it's almost like an apricot color. Um, most Naples yellow have a white added in the mix, causing their opacity and um, causing them to mix very interestingly with uh, blues. Uh, Naples yellow deep. Most of the time, it's a single pigment, uh, PBR42, I want to say. It's slightly brighter, I would say a regular yellow ochre to me. Um, let me check my list. Yep, this is a PBR24. And um, they're Naples yellow. It's PBR24 and PY6. 
So do you need both of them? No. Uh, if you use a lot of Naples yellow, use, um, just get a tube of this one, especially if you don't carry white in your palette. If you just like a nice yellow ochre, I would go for this Naples Yellow Deep unless you want a more transparent um, yellow ochre, in which case go with the Rossi, <laughs> which is hue, it's similar, but um, of course you have the transparency of the Sienna colors. Moving on to the Earth Tones, um, another group of colors don't particularly like but I found them very useful in paintings and in mixing so it's one of those colors I have to learn to love and the Nisis palette helped me with that because it had a very nice selection of yellows and ochres and siennas and pretty much anything you can think of when it comes to earth tones We'll see my paint experiments when we get to the yellow ochres because I had such a big collection. Uh, I created an interesting mixing chart uh, with the blues to see which one I would like the best, especially if you're looking for natural greens, mixing a yellow ochre with um, a blue color on your palette will lead to some very good options for your green landscapes. And of course, of all these three, very similar in hue. We'll see more once they um, they dry out. But the raw sienna, it's uh, the most transparent. And um, unless you want some interesting textures, I would um, go with either of them. If you're just looking for a particular hue. This gold ochre, easy to re-wet, very bright. I believe it's a mix of colors. Uh, leaning towards orange. Uh, actually, no, it's only a PY42. So it's a yellow, desaturated yellow pigment. Very nice. A quinacridone gold. I believe it's also a mix. Uh, I can detect the PY0150, that bright yellow in it. And I believe I have a tube of this color and it dries um, less bright, less intense than um, PY150, or at least in the swatch I made. And on this line, before I move the camera, we have a brown ochre. But that's a PBR7. So you'll see a lot of PBR7s. They can go anywhere from a desaturated yellow, yellow ochre, to a sienna color, to a burnt sienna, amber, um, everything PBR7. Um, I might put together a video. I know on handprint.com he has a very elaborate list of the PBR7 and all the shades uh, they can achieve. This magnesium brown, it's actually a pigment yellow, but to me, it's, um, it has very little yellow in it. I would say it's almost um, like an orange brown. I'm not sure if it's granulating. It's very opaque. We'll see how it dries. Uh, burnt sienna, I want to say probably another P. BR7 um, or another pigment used for Sienna's is the PR101 uh, Iron Oxide. This one, it's a PR101. And I should have noticed that because the PR101s tend to be slightly brighter. They do um, have a bigger drying shift, so you'll see it as you dry, it loses a little bit of the bright brightness. In this stage right now, reminds me almost of a quinacridone burnt orange. Light red. This is a color I wondered a lot about because in older uh, watercolor books, 
you'll see mention especially landscapes and um, artists from a few years back they mentioned this color quite a lot so I, went, I was never quite sure what they were talking about when they meant light red but it's it's good to see this color up maybe it's the equivalent of a um, more opaque burnt sienna or burnt orange I can see it used in landscape, especially fall and Venetian red and uh, Indian red two very classic colors opaque and the one, this these opaque colors are the ones that give me the most trouble because I either start my painting with them and um, I lose immediately the white of the paper or I add them towards the end and I don't like the, the look of them and then I end up hating the whole painting. So any tips and tricks on how to use opaque colors in watercolor? I know um, Denise came up with her collection Embrace Opacity and I have to go and watch her videos and maybe get an idea of uh, what kind of painting they work for and what kind of subjects. But overall, as these uh, colors, these earth tones are drying out, you can kind of see the slight differences in um, hue, in property, in transparency from ones that have more yellow, this one more like a peach. The, this raw sienna has that underglow, same with the quinacrid on gold. This gold ochre, this saturated, very nice color. I can see how hard it is to choose the right um, earth tone for your palette. And I'm very intrigued about this light red. Um, I would choose it before Venetian or Indian red if I want to experiment. Uh, with that kind of color although this burnt sienna it's very very nice and I almost use all the dot they give here for that little swatch but I do like uh, burnt oranges magnesium brown right here next to it I would say this is to me a classic uh, light brown very yellowed yeah i'll probably not use this color i would never buy it it's just the shade doesn't appeal to me at all and it's very easy to obtain it by mixing another yellow ochre with a red especially a desaturated earth red and this is the last stretch of the browns uh, starting here with the indian red very nice hue. I can see it used maybe in uh, in paintings of um, like still nature, some of the pots and the fabrics. Um, brown matter. This is a semi-transparent color. Very very pretty. I like the shade. I like the transparency, the vibrancy. Um, that's a PR 179 and I believe this um, color this pigment I had it I discovered it from Daniel Smith which I bought a tube a long time ago and I swatched in my paint experiments called um, burnt scarlet actually it was PR 175 uh, the Daniel Smith deep scarlet but I know I have the um, 179 also in um, in some other collection. But yes, this is the brown matter. Reminds me of the PR 209, 206. I got them all confused. But some of those um, scarlet, like deep scarlet, desaturated scarlet colors. Uh, Potter's Pink, another color I have from um, Winter and Newton. I have it in a small pen. It's one of the colors that you love to love but hardly use. I do like its uh, granulation. 
and seeing that granulation with other colors and i like the hue um, i am partial to um, the saturated mauves and purple so i can see the especially in fashion clothing accessories um, i just love this this color very soft very interesting pearly maroons i know a lot of artists love this color I do have the pearly maroon from um, uh, Naftami maroon, I mean, and that's from Daniel Smith, and that's a more violet maroon. Um, I, I never used it. It has a very, very large drying shift. Like right now in this shade, I really, really enjoy it. But then you see as it dries out. It loses the vibrancy, it gets very brown. Maybe this uh, Winter and Newton shade will change my mind. Also PR179. Um, same as Brown Matter, but less orange. I do like the transparency of it so probably in landscape if you're using Indian red or Venetian red and you want to change a little bit the look of your paintings you can swap them out pearly and violet this is closer to the naphthamine maroon from uh, Daniel Smith or violet iron oxide from Da Vinci or that's more like the caput mortem we'll see in just a little bit when i move the camera and we should be almost done with these brown colors and then we have the last stretch it's gonna be the gray thank you for watching this long video but that's how swatching colors usually are if you would like to see just the swatches um, sped up or on music i might do that just for my own entertainment but and let me know in the comments. Uh, Caput Mortum Violet. Another opaque colors in the same family of Venetian Red, Indian Red. Um, so if you like a, pa a palette with opaque colors, this would be a great addition. Very nice hue. Very violety. then raw umbra this looks very light i would call this maybe a yellow ochre i know um raw umber should be a lighter color but i would expect it to be slightly greener yeah it almost looks like it shouldn't be long on this part of the swatch so yeah, I'm not sure if this is truly a raw umber, but here it is. This is what they gave us on the dot. Burnt umber, classic brown, what you would think of a brown in a, a children's crayon set. Very transparent. Van Dyke brown, I would think maybe one a cooler brown. Semi-transparent also. Stainic. And the last of the browns, I have sepia and I believe I have a tube of this color. A little harder to re-wet, but it can get very dark and I believe it has a little bit of a texture. It's considered opaque, but I don't know, maybe because it can get really dark, it's hard to say. I do have a tube of the indigo and to me it's just, just, just too close. Uh, in hue to 
the um, phthalo blues and I believe it has a phthalo blue in its mix to me it's just too green to be an indigo but I've noticed with indigo colors the other this desaturated greenish blue or leaning towards violet I do prefer the ones leaning towards violet and the color is not as dark but because of the light situation it, it's gonna take a little bit until it dries to reveal the true shade uh, paints gray I do not have this in a tube form but I like it a lot I do prefer I, I've been using a lot the paints gray from um, from core but that's very blue violet this is also very nice compared to the indigo I would say just slightly bluer desaturated to me this is a truer indigo but still not the shade of indigo I'm thinking of uh, which is a more violet violet blue but then I think indigo is one of those colors everyone has a different expectation neutral tint I would call it like a violet gray very nice color I, you could probably easily get this one by mixing some dioxys in violet with a, a little bit of um, green or anything to neutralize it then ivory black I would expect a warm dark color and uh, people have different opinions about mixing black uh, or white or using black and white in watercolors I haven't paid it long enough to have an opinion about it um, I like to paint with uh, the hues I enjoy and then I like to have on my palette colors that would give me interesting mixes like I would never paint with them phthalo blue or a phthalo green but I like to mix with them to get very interesting darks and the last colors on this palette we have lamb black, mars black, davy gray, chinese white and titanium white so not much to say about this you've probably seen thousands of swatches they all look about the same in all uh, paint brands uh, this lamb black easily too easy to re-wet uh, it looks like it can get very very dark um, Mars black or Luna uh, black the way Daniel Smith calls theirs very granulating black color I'm not sure if this will granulate as much as Daniel Smith but we'll see once it's dry Davy gray another one of those colors named probably by an artist we use this combination a lot and I don't know anything about um, I've seen several artists using it um, I want to say um, more of a decorative artist or floral painters I can't think of um, the names right now but this one it rewets kind of hard I use I would put it in the same line as the a Terravert or the Viridian a very pale um, greenish gray the dot is not very large but yeah this is it and Chinese white and titanium white we won't see much of a hue but we'll see on this line Chinese white tends to be more transparent and then titanium white more opaque you can see even the dot it's much brighter but what I notice once they dry especially if I mix them with other paints or if I paint them on top of other paints um, it's still you still don't get that um, op opaqueness that you would get with a gouache um, just because it's still a, a watercolor
thank you so much if you stayed until the end of this video um i hope you enjoy my rambling and my swatches and if you don't have time to watch a whole video that's probably more than an hour long then keep an eye out from for a speed up version where you will see just the swatches um, have a great week ahead and happy painting uh, find your favorite color and keep making art thank you so much see you in my next video